This is an early preview, my first look at an upcoming release from Aerosoft. It's the Twin Otter, and it's soon to make its debut in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Welcome to the Sim Hangar. my name's Mark, thanks for watching and let's get started. Aerosoft have advised me that it'll be releasing on both the PC and Xbox, and the PC release can be expected in January. Subject to Microsoft updates, of course. The Xbox release will follow sometime later. Microsoft are notoriously slow at bringing it into the marketplace. Also, please note this is not a finished product. It is still in development. There's still some work on the animations. Quite a bit of work on the sound. And the manual and checklists are still being compiled. So this is the first look and not a formal review. With the package you get both Dash 100 and Dash 300 variants. This is the Dash 100 and it's the cargo option. There's also a passenger option available. The Dash 100 also features an opening nose cone. The Dash 300 options come with standard wheels as well as the Tundra wheel option, making it ideal to get into those tricky places. There'll also be an amphibian version. And not all the models are squeaky clean. Some are showing some wear and tear, dirt and grime. No Twin Otter offering would be complete without a floats variant. And this one sports a fairly lively livery. There's also a 300 series kitted out for skydiving. Apparently the Twin Otter can accommodate up to 22 skydivers. And the opening and closing of the skydive door is animated. Interestingly, there's also the four blade prop variant. There's one model kitted out with skis. It's the cargo variant and features the wide double opening doors. To test out the Twin Otter today, we're going to be taking a short hop. We're in the Himalayan mountains. We're in the Dash 300 cargo variant. And we're going to be doing a short hop to the infamous Lukla Airport. We're on the ground, cold and dark. And we will be running through a very quick start-up process. Manuals and checklists are not complete yet. I've flown this beauty in other sims, so I'll be relying on my memory. The quality of the texturing is what we've come to expect in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Textures are PBR rendered and it utilizes dynamic lighting. And there's a good amount of detail to the exterior views. This short hop workhorse, of course, is not directly X Factory. It's been around for a while, having first entered the market in the 50s with production continuing right through to the late 80s, and over 800 have been produced. And I believe there's still a couple flying today. Welcome to the business end of this iconic aircraft. Let's remove the control block. Once we've done that, just so we can see things easier, we'll hide the yoke as well. We'll just flip these two switches here, and they will open the cargo pods. And then we'll open up the other doors. We've already got a bit of cargo on board. We're going to go down to the end. On the right hand side is an access door. We can open that. And to our left are the cargo bay doors. And once again they're animated. But we're not quite done yet. Back to the cockpit. And we can open the pilot doors. First the co-pilot. And now the pilot's door. Some of these animations are a little brisk. But I'm aware that they're being worked on. So in terms of access and cargo storage, well, little problems here with the Dash 300 cargo variant. So all the doors are modelled, and all of them, as we've seen, are also animated as well. That's enough of that, let's get on. You need to pay some attention to how you load the aircraft, making sure the centre of gravity remains between the two white lines. And as I've chosen the cargo variant, it's loaded up by default. You can, of course, change the various weights and so on, making sure you remain within the limitations. There's no graphical representation of number of passengers or amount of cargo currently loaded. By the time the product is released, it will be sporting a full array of various checklists covering nearly all phases of flight. I'm not going to run through the cockpit item by item. What you get is fairly standard for an aircraft of this era. Rudder and elevator trims down by the side of the pilot. Circuit breakers that are not modelled. And of course the unique and iconic overhead, power, prop and fuel levers. I'd put the internal texturing on a par with the Just Flight Piper Arrow 3. 
The Twin Otter is fairly straightforward to start, not too complicated. There's enough here to keep you busy, but it's not study level. First things first, let's get the battery on. And then we need to turn on our DC master switch. And this will bring the aircraft to life. And now to our overhead panel and we want to put on our anti-collision or beacon lights and our position or nav lights. And whilst we're here, even though we've got no passengers, we'll put on our no smoking fasten seat belt. And I'll also put on the light for the flight compartment. Cautionary panel test. Apologies for that sound if it caught you unawares. Now to put on the engine igniters for the left and right engines. We'll be starting the engines momentarily. This is a turboprop powerful aircraft so just quick check that the parking brake is on which it is. And now both the left and right boost pumps on. There's a multitude of pre-flight tests that you can do. I'm not running through them all. This one's for the flight data recorder and this one tests your battery level. To make sure you've got enough charge if you're starting from battery. And a quick check that our fuel is in cutoff, prop is in feather, and we're at idle on the power lever. Flaps retracted. If you'd like me to do a setup for this aircraft for the Honeycomb Bravo Throttle Quadrant, let me know in the comments below. The Honeycomb Throttle Quadrant is the perfect one for this aircraft because it's one of the few that has all six axes, so setup is straightforward and provide you with a more real-world experience. Now to start the engines, move the switch to the left to start the left engine, although I have a sneaky feeling that it is actually the right engine that should start first. Both prop levers out of feather. Wait till the prop just starts to turn and then move the left fuel lever fully forward. We've got a good start on the left engine, so propeller fully forward for the left engine. Now, let's start the right engine. Switch is pushed to the right, prop is not in feather. Wait for the engine to start to turn and then we'll move the fuel lever all the way forward. Good start on the right, so prop all the way forward. And now just a moment just to check on the PNTs. Make sure there's nothing that should be ringing the alarm bells. That all looks okay. Back to the overhead panel and time to put on our generators. Both left and right. Pull them down to reset and they'll move back to on. With both engines started, we just check that the start switch is in the central position, which it is. With both generators on, we can turn on our left and right bleed air. Now we can arm our emergency lights. And underneath our bleed air is our air conditioning. I'm just going to move that onto auto. We're just about done. Done a very basic flight plan, which is shown in the GNS. And below that, I have my autopilot and my transponder. Some of the variants do have a slightly different cockpit layout, but all the equipment is basically the same, including the GNS 530 and 430. I also hear, but subject to confirmation, it'll be compatible with the GTN 750. Lovely all-world steam gauges, and there's a basic default autopilot included. For the sake of completeness, let's just set the transponder, turn the dial to switch it on, we're flying VFR today as it's fairly cool and clear. In the real world, of course, at this altitude you would be flying IFR. Weather changes very quickly up here. Set it to altitude and here are our trims. And we need to set some right rudder trim due to the left pull or torque of the engine. There's a handy mark there that's perfect for takeoff. And the front wheel is our elevator trim. That's done. We can just set auto feather which is that switch there. And as we're going to be taxiing directly onto the runway, strobe light can come on. My taxi light can also come on. And my pitot heat as well can come on. Note the sound change. Aerosoft are aware of this and are working on it. On the co-pilot side, we've got the windshield controls for the wipers and the heat. And it has a handy park feature. 
so they don't get stuck in the middle of the windscreen. I'll be hand flying the departure and part of the climb, but we'll also give the autopilot a bit of a test. We're almost ready to go, but just to set the altitude. We're at 8,100 feet and I'll set it for 12,000, that should be enough. Okay, let's get out of here, let's taxi to the runway, parking brake off, just nudge the power levers forward a little bit to get moving and then bring them back to idle. She needs no encouragement to taxi and taxi quite quickly, you need to keep dabbing the brakes. Make sure I'm heading in the right direction, which I am. If you have problems taxiing, just pull back on the prop levers a bit. Flaps to 10 degrees, and a reminder this is a beta version. Please ignore the internal sound anomalies. Power levers to 50%, let the revs build up before releasing on the brakes. Be prepared to apply a little bit of right rudder as you go, to hold yourself central on the runway. I'll be rotating at about 65-70 knots. not slow on the climb, flaps now fully up and trimming down a little bit to stop the nose up tendency. Note the trim indicator flashing trim on the cockpit panel. Speed 90 to 100 knots, that's perfect for the climb, coming up on 8,700 feet. I'm going to continue my climb out here, gain a bit of altitude before turning round and following the flight plan to Lukla. Coming back about 20% on the prop levers so I don't overstress the engine. Power levers at about 85%. 9000 feet, time to turn. And the twin otter is very picky about the bank angle. If you bank more than 30 degrees, well, bank she'll angle. tell you off. Bank angle. I should mention that this model is FPS friendly. Now completing the turn and we're just past 10,000 feet. This twin turboprop is really overpowered compared to the size of the airframe so you're constantly needing to adjust trim throttle she's quite capable of a thousand feet per minute climb and of course her stall or short takeoff and landing reputation precedes her she doesn't really need much room for takeoff and landing if needed That warning tells me I'm within a thousand feet of my planned altitude 12,000 feet Time to switch to autopilot. Our short cruise today is going to be at 12,000 feet. Hit the AP button to turn autopilot on and I'm going to set vertical speed and set that to 400 feet per minute. It'll climb at 400 until we hit 12,000 and hold that. I'm also now switching to nav mode. I'm slightly off course avoiding the high ground but I'm almost at 12,000 so I can now turn back on track. While I've underestimated the altitude needed, I've had to go up to 13,000 feet to clear the high ground. Not surprising really, this is Everest country, and as I pass over these mountains, I'm picking up a fair amount of turbulence. Pulling back on my power lever so it's not too bumpy. That's me turning off the autopilot. I'm going to manually navigate to Lukla myself. I don't want to climb too high, otherwise getting down to Lukla, which is over 9,000 feet, is going to be just too difficult. This turbulence is really chucking the Twin Otter around at the moment.
I've started a fairly steep descent, just over a thousand feet per minute, one eye on my airspeed, and my throttles cut back to about 20%. Both of my prop levers now pushed fully forward. Adjusting the attitude, the pitch of the aircraft, so I can slow down and get 10 degrees of flaps deployed. There we go, 10 degrees flap, the sounds are slightly out of sync. Flaps now, second stage down. I see I'm not the only one who decided to visit Lukla today. There's quite a few around. Because this was such a short hop, I left my landing lights on, so I don't need to worry about that. Fuel and prop fully forward. Initial approach speed around 90 knots, that's perfect. And now, turning to final. Flaps now, fully down. The runway is just ahead, and about a thousand feet to go. Fasten your seat belts. Prep your sick bags, and if you're of a nervous disposition, look away now. Speed 80 knots. There's still a bit of turbulence that's helping me focus. Speed now dropping to 70 knots, which is where I want to be, but applying a bit of power. I don't want to get too slow, too sloppy. Minimums, minimums. That's a stall warning, right on cue. Oh, a bit of a bounce, but we're down. Just letting the gradient slow us down. Turn coming up to our right and just dab the brakes. Now, let's find a parking. That looks good enough. Let's do a quick shutdown. Strobe and taxi lights can come off. Landing lights have already been switched off. As I taxied in, flaps are now fully retracted and bleed air off. Not sure how that wing inspection light got on, but let's turn that off as well. And we can turn our emergency lights off. We don't need our transponder, so we can shut that down. We can now bring our props back, but not into feather yet. There we go. And now time to cut the engines by moving the fuel levers all the way back to cut off. Wait for the engine to start slowing down. Then prop levers can be pushed to the feather position. Our two engine ignition or igniters can now be turned off, DC power off and we can switch our battery off as well. That's enough for today. Pilot door open and we'll also open the rear bay doors so that the cargo can be unloaded and that's our flight complete. We're done. Well, I hope that you enjoyed my first look at Aerosoft's Twin Otter, the de Havilland Canada Dash 6. And overall, I'm impressed. Once the sound and a few other anomalies are sorted out, it's going to be a cracking product. And for those of you that have followed me for some time, well, you'll know it's right up my street. Powerful, enough to keep me busy, but perfect for that bush trip, for that Alaskan adventure, or for an island or lake-to-lake -lake hop. And yes, I know what you're going to ask. Is it as good as or better than the Kodiak 100 from Simworks Studios? Well, it'd be very unfair of me to draw a comparison at this stage. This is a beta. And once the Twin Otter is formally released, well, I will do a full review and flight and draw any conclusions at that time. My thanks to Aerosoft for giving me access to an early preview of one of my all-time favourite aircraft. If you enjoyed the video, don't forget to give it a thumbs up. It does help the channel. And last but not least, thank you very much for joining me today. Stay well, take care, see you soon, and bye for now.